Welcome to Tell It Like It Is. I'm Gary Pollan. This show is a fresh look at politics and public affairs. Here we will give you the real deal, not bias or spin, uh, or what the major media of politically correct opinions are called facts, or at least they masquerade as facts. When we provide you opinions, you will know it. This show rejects doctrinal uniformity. This political disease is a terminal threat for our democracy and the future of this country. The anti-American mobs out there are not appeasable and they are not going away. You may not be interested in what they are doing, but they are very interested in you, your country, and our future. Their target is destruction of America. On that happy note for today's show, I'm pleased and honored to introduce Chase Undermeyer. Chase is a former U.S. Ambassador to Qatar. He's a former state representative. He's a former Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He is a former, God, it goes on forever, Chase, Director of Presidential Personnel for uh, President Bush. And he was, a, he was President, Vice President Bush's personal assistant, one of his top aides. Uh, and since then, he has come home and is, was head of the State Board of Education. I mean, his resume, it could go on for the whole 20-minute segment we're going to do with Chase. So without further ado, and he's also an author, we'll talk about his books. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Chase Undermeyer. Thank you, Gary. Uh, in fact, I, I hope you would fill out the 20 minutes with just my resume. It'll save a lot of time and trouble. Oh, your resume is very impressive. And, and, and folks, to tell you, I, th I believe it was 1976 when you ran for state representative. We were new in Houston, Esther and I, and uh, we heard about Chase and uh, what a smart guy he was. He was the political writer at the Chronicle at the time. God, God, remember that? That was when the Chronicle was actually a real newspaper. And uh, Esther and I coordinated the apartment leafleting campaign for, for you, Chase, and you were successful. And on whether that was good or bad that you got elected to the legislature, I'm not sure. You certainly didn't stay there very long, but you've had an impressive and distinguished career. And now you have a great career as an author. I, I guess I'm sure you're writing your fifth book because you've written four. I brought one with me which is your memories of in the White House with George W. Bush, which is a wonderful book. In fact, I went to the, the, uh, the party where it was introduced in Houston, uh, where you spoke and others spoke, and, and President Bush was interviewed talking about uh, your book and his experience with you. And of course, he's a blessed memory. He was a, he was a wonderful person, and he was a good president. He really was. So he's a loss. So Chase, we live in an entirely different world today. So today we're concerned about I'm concerned about my granddaughters, okay? Where, what are they going to do? They're ready to start school, and uh, the, the, the powers that be don't think children should be allowed to go to school in person. They want them to do it on the Internet. They want them to do, I'm not sure how they're going to do it and whether it's going to work. So as a former head of the State Board of Education, uh, I thought you might have some opinions as to whether or not we can put, get our children back to school. What do you say? Well, first of all, put the emphasis on former chairman of the State Board of Education. I was appointed by then Governor George W. Bush when I was contacted by his assistant, Margaret LaMontagne, as she was later, uh, Margaret Spellings, who became Secretary of Education during his presidency. Anyway, when she contacted me about doing that job, I said, Margaret, I don't know anything about public education. And in her very gritty way, she said, well, you might learn something. <laughs> so whatever I managed to learn during that experience uh, from, from that period, I'm happy to share. Um, but it's not with any particular current knowledge other than any of us who read the paper. Let me say that we in Texas are fortunate in that we have about 1,100 school districts, independent school districts. And as you would expect, a lot of them are pretty small. But scattered throughout this immense vastness of Texas. And actually, I think that's a good thing because uh, if our state leadership is wise, it will push all this decision making down to the school districts, which means they'll be able to tailor this very difficult and uh, very imperfect sort of decision at the local level, at the lowest possible level. And if a big district like Houston ISD or Dallas or San Antonio or WISE, they will also decentralize the decision making to um, areas of their city because each area of the city is so different in terms of its vulnerability, its population, its ability to 
uh, do online learning. Uh, so that's my basic uh, concept on well, the a, best response. There, well, there is a, no good response. Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics said that uh, all policy considerations for this school year start with the goal of having students physically present in school. Uh, they think that, and in fact, and they also reviewed kind of the statistics from around the world, especially younger students, elementary students, uh, very low risk for picking up COVID and very low risk of spreading COVID. Uh, then you have the complications, Chase, of course you're aware of the number of children in, in, around the country that go to school. That's where they get most of their meals. I mean, people forget that. That's important. The social isolation. And then the problem is the digital divide. That is that if, you're, if you live in a middle class home, you have internet, fast internet service, you have a notebook computer, you have a, a laptop, you have things you can use to learn outside of school. But if you come from a poor family, you may not have that. So keeping children out of school really messes up, messes up education-wise for the poor and underprivileged. So you would think, you would think that uh, the liberal teachers union would want to be able to help these kids uh, get an education, but it seems like they don't really care. And that really bothers me. So it really doesn't surprise me. Does it surprise you? Uh, well, let's separate teachers out of teacher unions. Right. Uh, I, I do believe that teachers want to teach and they care about their kids and they want their kids to be healthy and they want the families of those kids to be healthy. Um, uh, and it's a valid question whether or not teacher unions are saying this, I'll say it. It is a valid question that if you separate students or you have them come on alternate days or some other kind of technique, that is going to increase the amount of work that they're going to have to do, the teachers, that is. So I, I do sympathize with them, and I'm not quite sure if I were on a school board uh, just what the answer is. Clearly, if teachers are going to work harder, they're going to need, uh, they should be compensated for that extra work. And uh, I uh, certainly go along with what you quoted the American Society of Pediatrics is saying, and that is the default choice should be for students to be in a classroom. And, uh, and then on that district by district or sub district by district level, decide whether that's working, whether it's uh, endangering health, either of the kids or of their adult supervisors uh, or not, and, and proceed from there. I was reading, uh, I, I forgot, one of, the, one of the many newspapers I read, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. I don't count the Houston Chronicle as a paper now since they just copy everything from everyone else. But there was an article talking about the problem last spring in some school districts where they had to make rules that the kids had to get out of bed to do virtual education. They had to get out of their pajamas for virtual education. It, it was like, I read this and go, what a joke. Here's some ideas, though, Chase, that have been put out there by people who are thinking outside the box, how do we deal with this? One is outdoor classes, less chance for COVID to transmit outside. Expand by adding recent college graduates who are unemployed to work as teacher's aides and use the pod system. So some group would be in class, some group would be uh, outside doing an activity, some would be involved in uh, recess or play. I thought that was an interesting idea. That, of course, would allow parents to work, allow kids to eat who depend on the school, uh, and, and the experience in other countries with elementary ed especially was few outbreaks confirmed, and even this in America where no one talks about it, few outbreaks in daycare centers uh, of COVID that we've heard about. So uh, it's part of, I guess, the scare tactics that they want to keep the country shut down. Sometimes I almost feel that uh, they, this, this whole problem with COVID goes away the day after the election of Joe Biden uh, gets elected president. And suddenly it's not a problem anymore, but I could be wrong. All right, I want to move on, Chase, and talk to you about history and canceling history. You know, you, you've had a front row seat like we all have for the crazy mobs who are out there. So first, we had, of course, legitimate protests uh, about the death of, of George Floyd. All, everyone, everyone with a heart uh, supports that. But then we had the problem with violence, with looting, uh, with destruction of, of, of statues in history. And of course, they got so excited, they started, they, they started with the Confederates, and then they started destroying statues of people that were anti-slavery, because I guess the mob had no limit. And that's why I talk about that in my opening, because it concerns me. I mean, it concerns me, Chase, that we're now in day 73 of riots in Portland, Oregon. It concerns me we had riots again in Chicago, this time 
in the Magnificent Mile, Upper Michigan Avenue, like San Francisco, used to be a really beautiful area of Chicago. That place has fallen apart. Of course, that's the murder capital of the world. So we have our cities basically falling apart, and it's really of concern. And along with that, we want to teach our children that it should, you should be ashamed to be an American, that being an American is not anything special. In fact, it's actually something pretty bad. And my concern, Chase, and I want to hear from you because you are an historian, are you concerned that the destruction of, and the belief in America's past is designed to uh, achieve the destruction of America in the near future? Well, the matter you mentioned, Gary, of, of particular individuals like Abraham Lincoln or Ulysses Grant or others who were uh, abolitionists who actually emancipated uh, the enslaved of America points out that there isn't any shall we say, deep thought that goes into a lot of mob action. Uh, and I'm not uh, speaking of any particular place or particular action, but it does point out how uh, all of us, uh, and I should say that uh, with emphasis, all of us need to know more history. Uh, Harry Truman said, the only thing new in the world is the history you haven't read. <laughs> and it's just truer that some of us need to read more history than others. Uh, and the idea that they want to read, take history away in our schools, not educate our children. Uh, and, I'm, and, and I said, I, and from my standpoint, I mean, you know, we all took history growing up, right? When we went to school, uh, you know, you took American history, you took Texas history, uh, if you educated in Texas. And if there are those who think we should add other things to study, we should. But I mean, but I remember, uh, you know, when I was in high school, uh, and, and I think, I forgot, I think it was an English class. I mean, one of the books assigned was the autobiography of Malcolm X, which I found fascinating and interesting, and I thought uh, gave a perspective that needed to be heard. Uh, so this idea that we haven't been teaching this stuff over the years it doesn't hold water with me. I think it has been available, but you've got to take advantage of it. Well, history, they tell us, is always written by the winners, uh, but history is written by everybody. And that's why Truman said what he did. That is, it's to all of our value to uh, read as much history as possible from different perspectives. Uh, if you talk about statuary, statuary is always contemporary. That is, it is made in a particular time with the view of that time. And from an art history point of view, that's very valuable to know. And uh, I was talking to a, a, a art historian who said that he thought that what happened in India after it won its independence from Great Britain in 1947 uh, was very good. That is, the Indian government uh, found itself in possession of all kinds of statues of Queen Victoria <laughs> and various other monarchs and generals who uh, you might say were politically incorrect as of that particular time. And they did not destroy those statues. What they did was move them to zoos. And, uh, uh, and from an art historian point of view, uh, let's hope these are all preserved rather than destroyed. Uh, in fact, I kind of lament the fact that nowhere in America you can find a statue of George III. They were all pulled down and melted down or tossed into harbors, whatever happened to them. And uh, it would be nice to have a statue somewhere of old King George. Do you think the mindless destruction of statues, uh, because they, I guess because they were old, by the mob, does that cause you any concern about this younger generation coming up uh, that populates Antifa and other radical groups? Well, it's, uh, it, it's very case dependent as to who's in the statue and what <laughs> that person actually did. I found uh, that it is disturbing when uh, perfectly uh, admirable people from the cause of, uh, of uh, equal rights and uh, freedom and uh, justice in this country are pulled down for reasons that are beyond me. Uh, uh, I can understand how there might be anger about a particular a uh, person who did something, but it reminds me that a few years ago, I happened to go to Mongolia right mm. after they voted out a communist government. They'd been ruled for 75 years by communists, and I went there soon thereafter to help the new democratic government. I noticed throughout all of Ulaanbaatar, the capital, there were still statues of Lenin, 
and I asked my hosts uh, why that still was the case. And they shrugged and said, well, one of these days we'll do something with them, but we have more important things to do than uh, pull down statues. And I'd say that's true in America as well. We have a much greater uh, uh, agenda to work on than being angry at uh, what a sculptor put on a pedestal once. Well, that's, that, that's a great point. Let, let me ask you this question. You know uh, uh, George, President Bush 41 very well, obviously. Uh, how do you think he would react to this time of trouble in America? Well, we saw how he did react in times of trouble, uh, such as after the uh, Rodney King episode in Los Angeles in 1992, when there were civil disturbances. Uh, that is, he uh, was a strong leader, and he backed up the call of the governor of California for federal assistance to restore order in Los Angeles. But at the same time, he was sympathetic with those people who felt that uh, the cause of justice had not been served. Uh, and I think that's the way we should view all of these cases. And in fact, I would say that one of the great lessons of American history is that we are a constantly self-examining and self-improving society. We have never attained perfection and no society has attained perfection, but we have throughout the arc of our history made progress. Clearly not enough progress in the opinion of some people, but I repeat, the uh, entire thrust of American history is toward uh, greater justice, greater democracy, greater uh, respect for individuals and uh, different opinion. That's good. Are you working on a new book? I am. As a matter of fact, <laughs> it is a memoir. So oh, uh, wow. the books that you have kindly referred to are a form of memoir and that they were based on a personal journal that I kept. Uh, have kept all my life, but particularly during the Reagan and first Bush administrations. But this memoir is a memoir. It's a, a narrative of the entirety of my life uh, and uh, such famous occasions as the state representative race in 1976. <laughs> you, Esther, helped so yes. uh, decisively. Well, we think we, we think we were helpful. So how is what is that? Do you have a publishing date yet? Uh, no, uh, I'm only going through edits. Uh, I sent it to my publisher, the good folks at Texas A&M University Press, and, and one of these days, uh, maybe it will appear on a shelf near you. Is it? Is it? Is it going to be a long book, Chase? A lot of pages. Uh, yes, I, I'm so sorry to say, and this may be why I haven't heard from my friends uh, at the Texas A&M Press. They may not have enough paper in stock to print it. Well, I mean, uh, I, remember, I remember going the first time I met you back in, in, the, in the 70s. You were, you were a note taker and you'd been doing it, what, ever since, what, ever since you were five years old, something like that? Is that when <laughs> uh, you Not quite that young, but <laughs> at nine years old, I started That's keeping impressive. a diary, which admittedly is odd behavior for nine year old or 19 year old for that matter. That's impressive. It really is. Well, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm looking forward to that coming out. And uh, I certainly will, will have you back on, on, on television to talk about your, your latest book, uh, in, in, or new book. Now, the latest book, the latest book is How to Behave in Public. Was that, was that the title? Uh, it was called How Important People Act. Okay. And that's, when it, and, and that is, that's directed at who? Donald Trump? Joe Biden? Who? <laughs> uh, no particular individual. It's actually uh, devoted or written with uh, young uh, and rising uh, adults in mind, those people who are going into the workforce, particularly those who are starting out in uh, executive tracks, uh, because uh, a lot of people, uh, especially young people, when they appear in public are, are not, shall we say, self-aware. They, they are not thinking of how they come across. To them, they're still pretty anonymous. But if, let's say, they work for a company, and the company sends them to accept an award or give an award or sit on the local chamber of commerce a board of directors they then become that company and wow. in my view they have greater responsibility uh, to act dress and speak in a way that reflects something bigger than themselves was that and put so out that by was the main target was that put out by an press also 
it was a, published by a local press, which unfortunately is no longer in existence. So that book is now out of print. Oh my goodness! Uh, well, maybe A and M will reprint it. Every copy. But uh, your other books are all available from A and M Press, and I'm sure that they're also available on Amazon and other traditional book sources. All a worthy read. Well, Chase, time is up. I mean, we could spend hours talking. Uh, and I certainly will want to have you back, as I have had over the years on television, interviewing, interviewing you because you have so much knowledge. Uh, you thought about running for anything else? My final question, you get 10 seconds. You want to run for anything else? Uh, you know, I am well past my use-by date. <laughs> okay. Well, say hello to your wonderful family, and, and we will see you next time. And we'll be back you, after Gary. these messages uh, with our next guests. We'll be, we have Dwight Jefferson and Jolanda Jones. We're going to be talking about sports and COVID, and we're also going to be talking about the potential assault on women's sports caused by the recent Supreme Court decision. We'll be back. Ron Carter Cadillac, Houston's only Cadillac to your door dealer, delivers test drives to your home or office. Like the new 2020 XT4 Premium Luxury, only $359 a month. The new 2020 XT5 Premium Luxury, $399 a month. Or the first ever 2020 XT6 Premium Luxury, just $499 a month. All for 39 months lease with just $1 down. Or purchase and choose 0% APR for 60 months plus $1,500 bonus cash. Visit roncartercadillac.com. Ron Carter Cadillac, Houston's only Cadillac to your door dealer, delivers test drives to your home or office. Now purchase the new 2020 Escalade and enjoy $9,500 in total purchase allowance, plus 2.99% APR for 72 months with no payments until 2021. Or drive the 2020 Escalade for only $7.99 a month for 39 month lease with only $1 down. Ron Carter Cadillac. Visit roncartercadillac.com. When it comes to protecting yourself and your partners, all the information out there can be overwhelming. Visit our website. We are a free and confidential service striving to help you stay informed and stay notified. We are committed to a healthy Houston. Have you been injured in an 18-wheeler accident, truck accident, car accident? Was someone texting and ran into the back of you, not paying attention? It doesn't matter what it is. Give me a call, Attorney Willie Powell's. We'll fix it today. The number is 281-881-2457. Again, that number is 281-881-2457. We'll fix it today. Call Attorney Willie Powell's. Welcome back to Tell It Like It Is. I'm Gary Pollan. We're in the second half of the show, and today we're going to be talking about sports and COVID, women in sports, Title IX, the Supreme Court decision, and its impact on uh, women athletes. Uh, our first guest in the studio is the Honorable Dwight Jefferson. Uh, Dwight uh, not only was a, let's go all the way back, uh, he was an all-Southwest Conference defensive end for the University of Texas. That's actually where I met him. Uh, he went on to law school. He was uh, a state district judge uh, appointed by then Governor George W. Bush, later president. D Dwight today is uh, of counsel with Coates Rhodes, which is a prominent law firm uh, in the Houston area. Not only that, Dwight served on the Metro Board of Directors, which in the age of COVID may become increasingly <laughs> irrelevant, Dwight. And uh, he also tried out for the NFL and got smart and decided not to stay. So welcome, Dwight Jefferson. Thank you. Thank and then on, on Zoom is uh, Jolanda Jones. And Jolanda is a world-class athlete. Uh, she was a hepta athlete, which is the female equivalent of a decathlon, which, as many people know, the most difficult set of sports you can do as an athlete. And she won uh, a bronze medal at the Pan American Games. She was a United States champion. She was a uh, outstanding athlete at the University of Houston, and she was a three times NCAA champion. 
Not only that, when she finished, she got an NCAA postgraduate scholarship for law school, went on to law school, and is a great lawyer. She also served on Houston City Council, uh, but decided, I think, that she was better off being a lawyer where she represented clients, where, by the way, she is one hell of a fighter. I've seen her in action in the courts, Dwight, and she never lets up. And she also served on the HISD board. Oh, that's uh, right. Board of <laughs> okay. Well, she served on the HISD board. That's more of a condolence because that was, that was very challenging and difficult for anybody, especially someone who's capable of Jolanda. So, well, Jolanda, welcome to the show. Uh, and uh, you, you, I like your background. Uh, it's very nice. Well, thank you very we're much. disappointed you couldn't make it into the studio, but I'm sure you, were, you ended up being busy with something for one of your many clients. So let's talk about uh, first COVID in sports, uh, where we're at today. You know, COVID in sports, and, and then we'll get into the the, the, the the other topic. But folks are interested. Uh, we've essentially been home for six months. Our sports was essentially shut down. Our intercollegiate sports were shut down. Our professional sports were shut down. Uh, now there's some professional sports without any audiences and the like. So I'll ask you, Jolanda, first. Are we to fear that because of the COVID crisis that sports as we know it's going to disappear? So I just want to make a quick correction since you brought up the great Southwest Conference. Since <laughs> Judge Jefferson uh, was a football player in the great Southwest Conference, I actually won a whole bunch of conference championships. And I was actually voted Southwest Conference runner-up athlete of the decade. You so were? Since we wow. Won, and I actually won United States champion, uh, United States championship as well since we want to talk about uh, Judge Jefferson, I just want to tell you what I think is important oh, look, to me. You, you that were... not there. <laughs> I actually think that COVID is at least changing sports as it is now. And I think that's important because sports is not more important than COVID. I don't care how much people want to be entertained by athletes. And I believe that it is dangerous uh, for the NCAA to ask athletes to compete now since they don't know what's going on with COVID and COVID is real. I've lost a lot of people to COVID. So I know there are those people that are like, no, there's no such thing or there's a conspiracy theory. Um, athletics needs to be safe for everyone. And so I don't really care. I would much rather be alive and not playing sports than playing sports and die. I mean, in the scheme of things. Dwight, uh, your comment. Well, uh... I think that, you know, sports uh, throughout history has played a very, very important role in all societies. And I think that sports and the competition that is, that is brought by sports is, 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 is something that, that uh, really is uh, part of the human spirit and human makeup. And I think that, uh, as Jolanda pointed out, COVID is real. Uh, but I do think that what we've seen is that it is manageable, and we see both in Europe and then as we see here in the U.S. Uh, with uh, the NBA bubble uh, and with Major League uh, Baseball and how they're proceeding, uh, that you really can still have sports and you can manage it. But, I mean, uh, as you see with the NBA I mean, it takes a lot of effort and a, and a lot of money to be able to do it correctly. And so if it can be done relatively safely, uh, based upon the fact that most of the athletes that are going to be competing uh, generally don't, you know, have a lot of the comorbidities and, and things of that nature that uh, older people like myself may <laughs> have, that uh, it may not, be as, may not be as dangerous for them. Uh, I am a season ticket holder uh, at the University of Texas uh, football, and so uh, uh, definitely I would be disappointed uh, if the NCAA made the determination that they could not uh, uh, play this season. But as Jelana pointed out, I mean, if it uh, if if they cannot do it safely, then I would agree with her that uh, they shouldn't do it at all. But uh, hopefully. <laughs> they can give it a try and see if it can be done safely. And if so, because with this whole COVID period where everybody is shut in, I can't tell you uh, <laughs> how, how, how important and, and, and how celebratory uh, I've been uh, with the uh, NBA even without fans and Major League Baseball <laughs> even without fans because 
for the most part, most people followed sports on television anyway. And so uh, not having the fans there, I don't think it makes a tremendous amount of difference. And when you have competitive athletes, uh, they really don't need a crowd to want to perform and to win. And so um, I'm hoping that uh, they're able to manage it and we can uh, have sports even in that limited fashion. All right, you predict, so is there going to be a college football season? Your prediction? Mm. Well, as, as we briefly discussed earlier, the question is going to be uh, uh, how devastating would it be to many programs uh, if they were not to have the season? And could, it, could, it, could it end sports at many institutions uh, if they uh, shut down for a year and don't have the revenues to keep the programs going? And that's a, that's a legitimate fear, wow. isn't it, Yolanda? If they don't have the money, there's no, not going to no, be so programs. You know so, you know, so you invited me on this show because you wanted to go with me. I'm actually dumbfounded. If I had <laughs> hair to pull out, I swear I'd pull it out. Um, the fact that somebody is bored and they and sports has been a, a fabric in America or wherever is is a reason to have sports. First of all, that's BS. I don't know when this is coming on, so I'm not going to use those cuss words. Good. But what I will say is this. First of all, I wouldn't care if athletes – don't have the comorbidity as people your age, uh, Judge Jefferson. I'm at my home doing this Zoom because COVID is real. I'm as in shape as anybody. And you don't know what's going to cause you to die. And mm -hmm. you want to know what? Let's experiment with your people because they've said that children who get COVID, who get COVID it changes the way they think. It, it messes with their brains. And oh, by the way, a seven-year-old kid just died of COVID and didn't have underlying conditions. So the fact that we want to experiment on athletes is craziness. The fact that universities may not make money because they're used to revenue from sports. So what? I am, you know, here's the, here's the difference between people that, that are probably on the upper end of the wealth gap is when you grow up poor like me, you actually learn to make decisions, very crucial decisions that not a lot of people have to make, which is, dividing stuff up between needs and wants wanting to play sports that's a want okay wanting to watch sports is a want right needing to breathe is a need and if you even look in the in the in the in the entertainment industry tyler perry was talking about what he has had to do to finish his productions on time and when and they were testing people three to four times they said it's exponentially more uh expensive he has people on their campus on their quarantine campus for two weeks at a time and they go out right the athletes can't have their families with them and and because you want to be entertained by us because i'm still an athlete once an athlete always an athlete i should potentially put my life in danger or for that matter put in danger people that i may come in contact with like my mother who's an older person or my grandmother at, or whomever, that is craziness. Have you seen how many kids have gone to school and come back and infected their whole family? And so now, and it, and oh, by the way, in Europe, they're not doing sports. They're, they're trying to do stuff with sports and athletes are still testing positive. Yeah. And me wearing my mask and me being responsible isn't even necessarily about me staying safe because look at all the young people who haven't gotten COVID or who haven't had negative effects of it, but they brought it home to their parents and their parents almost died or their parents died. I cannot believe people are think that there's like a legitimate reason to argue that we should have sports over life because Your vote the is no life college is too football. Much. Anyway, vote, I could go no on college whatever. football. Okay, I got your vote. All right, let's move on to the other topic: women in sports. Dwight, Title IX. That's a part of the Civil Rights Act, I believe. Tell tell our well, viewers title, what it is. Uh, title IX, I think, first came into effect in the late seventies. Uh, the early 80s when, when, when I was at the university. My understanding of Title IX uh, is that uh, uh, it ended uh, uh, discrimination in college sports uh, between men's and women's athletics and what it required the universities to do to bring equity and to create opportunity for more women uh, to earn scholarships uh, to attend college uh, was that they had to increase the number of competitive sports uh, that women had for scholarship athletes. And that's why, uh, 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 that's where you had uh, the women's softball, uh, women's soccer, uh, women's basketball, all of those programs really uh, uh, were added 
and uh, started to grow during that yeah, period and, of time. And I'm so and I'm so old. You go back when I started at the University of Texas. Yolanda was probably in grade school right. uh, or younger. Uh, there were no women scholarship athletes. None. None. They were club sports is what mm -hmm. they had. So this was a design to give women the opportunity to compete too, because women are athletes well, too. Well, I mean, giving women the opportunity to compete, but but keep in mind, I mean, uh, uh, like Jolanda and myself, uh, 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 earning an athletic scholarship uh, is like opening a door for many of these young people, uh, many who grow up poor. And uh, as our trainer at Texas used to tell us, uh, you're here to get an education uh, by way of your athletic ability. Yeah, and, and, and in this instance, both you and Jolanda took advantage of your scholarship and your opportunity to become outstanding lawyers. Right. I mean, and, that, that, and that's so, a big deal. And so Title IX opened those opportunities up for women, whereas before, those were opportunities that were only limited to men. All right, Jolanda, and then the Supreme Court uh, this, uh, this, this summer came out with so their decision. Up, wait, wait, wait. So, question for you. So you just let him talk about sports and you talked about me as if I wasn't even in this conversation <laughs> since I happen to be like a girl athlete. Oh, we know you're a girl like athlete. I, did I say that, Dwight? Right, he's coming yeah, to I you now. Say, say that. But I don't need for you to speak for me. Well, I'm not speaking for you. Right? I, I'm so, giving well, you the chance clear. to ask so you a question. I had, I had full academic rides to Ivy Leagues as well. So my sports did didn't just school. My well, brain I'm glad, did. Well, I'm glad. I, I like you of age, so I'm glad you went there. But my, but my, but that's not my point. My point is this: Title IX was brought about so that there be equity in sports, and it's not just softball or whatever. Each school actually gets to decide which which sports they're going to add with equity. So, for example, when I was at the University of Houston, I I signed a full ride to U of H. They even had a press conference for me, which is very unusual because I'd never known a girl to have a press conference because people want to know where I was going to school and whether I was taking athletic or academic scholarship and whether I was playing track or basketball because I was an All-American in both. Right. The first day I was on campus at the University of Houston as a full scholarship athlete, I literally was not allowed to go into the training table, which is where men's football, men's basketball, and golf were because it, at U of H we had 16 NCAA championships. So they treated me differently. They actually treated walk-on football players better than they treated a, a full scholarship girl or woman's athlete. And I actually was a Hertz number one award winner where they picked the number one athlete from each from each state and I represented Texas. So Title IX was absolutely needed because we were treated as second class citizens. So that's what it's about, okay. right? And it's about yeah. equity in anything. So for example, if a boys basketball team at a high school does really well, you'll have like Nike coming in wanting to support the boys sports. Well, that's not fair for the boys to have all brand new stuff and they treat girls like second class citizens. So it's actually a lesson in ending patriarchy and having a society where you're not judged on what genitalia you happen to have been born with. All right, and while we're talking about genitalia, <laughs> Jolanda, the Supreme Court said uh, that uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits workplace discrimination based on sex, race, religion, or national origin, is extended to LGBTQ people. Okay, that's what they decided. Those, uh -huh. there, are, there are observers who read this and said, uh, uh, this is a, a threat to women's sports and women's scholarships and the opportunity. Let me finish the introduction. And there's a group that was formed called Save Women's Sports that has, I'm sure, a, a number, there's over 300 women athletes who have written the NCAA to make sure that women born as women are not discriminated against. Uh, led by Martina Navratilova, Donna Di Verona, and others. Anyway, so they're concerned about that. And the legislature in Idaho actually passed legislation signed by the governor called Fairness in Women's Sports Act, which basically uh, protects women born as women from uh, being discriminated against unfairly by men who were born as men who become women. Uh, that's, what, that's an executive summary of what happened. So Dwight... <laughs> Uh, after all the hard work for women uh, to, to achieve Title IX and, and, and somewhat equality, it's still not equal, but it's a lot better than what it was. Uh, is this decision a threat to uh, women athletes? Or Well, I mean, I think it, it, 
it really cre creates a, a, a real fairness issue. And uh, how fair is it for uh, women athletes to, uh, to have to compete with uh, trans transgender women athletes? Uh, I mean, I think we can, when you look at that and you review that, a lot of it is going to have to come down to uh, experts and what the experts say with regards to uh, uh, the 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 uh, physiology uh, associated with uh, gender and whether or not uh, uh, there's a fairness issue that's created uh, for women who have to compete against ch transgender individuals. And I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a, it, it's it's a very relevant and it's a reasonable inquiry. Yeah, in fact, there's there there are lawsuits that have already been filed in the Northeast involving high female high school students who were state champions, state runners up, and then the next year a transgender female shows up and they and and they can't compete and they because they don't the have the floor with them. Yeah, that's basically <laughs> what happened. Now, to be clear, Jolanda Jones it may, it would be a problem for Jolanda Jones because she was. Essentially, the right. decathlon athlete. She's a superior athlete. Right. She's Probably a super superior athlete. to a lot of a super athlete. But right. how many Jolanda Joneses are there in the United States? I would very suggest few. very few. She is something special. And so she she's unique. But for the average for the average high school or college female athlete, uh, I mean, it really is a real question of fairness. What do you think about that, Jelana? I mean, is it a fairness issue? Well, I'm glad you two men decided to invite this woman into this conversation because <laughs> you guys were going on and I was about to pull this hair out that I don't have. Um, but don't do that. <laughs> first of all, you guys are very, very, very pres presumptuous. And, and I, so first of all, we don't need you to, I don't need you to protect me, right? And yes, you're we're right, I compete. We're even not trying to protect it, you. So I did, sounds like y'all trying to make decisions for we girls. But it's I digress. Discussion. Okay. okay. But, but, my, but it's, it's, maybe it's because I'm on Zoom and you guys are in each other's presence that you're talking to each other. And yeah, Jolanda, sort of, we wanted you live. We, we, we love you live, but, but you couldn't you know, make but it. But COVID is real. So as much as I like you, I'm not going to be close to you. But okay. I say that to say this, that even a, amongst women, different women have different strengths, right? They just do. There have been women who competed internationally, who some argued because they were, uh, I guess, more masculine and people think women should be, which also goes to, there is no like right or wrong woman. There's no too masculine or too feminine women, but that's a whole nother story. And so, and even between men, there are men who compete at very high levels. And then there are men who couldn't beat women for lack of a better word. So I don't see you talking about that. Yeah, but that's not right. the issue. The so, issue so, so is I have, I have the, 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 the I issue have, is men, men competing, trans, transgender women competing against against uh, uh, natural women. Let's call it that. Or or born women. Well, so why are, we, why are we talking about women? Why are we not talking about transgender men competing against born men? Transgender. I, I can't hear you. I was like cricket. Well, I don't know. But let me exactly. let me let me suggest this to you, Jolanda. Exactly. Team US, this is someone you probably know. That's team, not team, as pressing an issue. No. Team USA sprinter Allison Felix holds the most world's athletic championship medals in history. Yet in 2018, 275 high school boys ran faster times than the 400 meters on 783 occasions. Even the best female Olympic athletes would lose to literally thousands of male athletes, including those who would be considered second tier in the men's category on any given day. That's the reason Martina Navratilova, 300 Friends, wrote this letter. And Martina Navratilova, by the way, prior to this, had been very active in the LGBTQ community and outspoken uh, and came out a long, long time ago. So they're I concerned. I have the community as well. I'm a lesbian as well. But okay, so... So, I fit all we still we up. still like you, Jolanda. I but still no, like, like you. I'm straight. <laughs> there are women. I mean, I mean, there are women who can compete with men. I mean, I know when I was growing up, there was a 
a, a, a girl in our neighborhood, and she played basketball with the guys every day. And she was as good as any guy uh, playing basketball. And so there are women that can compete, like yourself, uh, with, with men, okay? But as Gary pointed out, when you look at the numbers, it's going to be overwhelming that the majority of women ath athletes who are competing in the same sport as the male athletes, performance-wise, their, 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 their times and their numbers just aren't going to be the same. And then from the standpoint of, like, let's say, for example, in wrestling and, and, and sports that involve, you know, physical contact, uh, 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 the transgender women just have a decided advantage. And that's why I say it's, a, it's, a, it's really a fairness question. Is it, is it fair for the women to have to compete with them? And it's that's really the question a I have. It's really a constitutional question. The Constitution says you don't get to discriminate against people because of all of the, the LGBT, religion, age, just gender, everything. So, well, so it's a really a constitutional question. So now you're, so you're, I guess you're suggesting that we should just throw that out. We should just throw out the Constitution because we think that it lands unfairly against a group of people that I believe you're mischaracterizing, but that's actually what's great about this country is the First Amendment allows you to have, you know, you know, or allows us to have our our different opinions. Absolutely. But I, I but but I believe that if you're going to make the the argument about trans women, why aren't you making the argument about trans men? Because even within the trans community, the the even as it relates to the trans community, we are targeting women well if you're talking that's about that's a good point you know but you no know, but the thing is so uh females who who just who are, are actually males they don't have the natural athletic advantages that we go the other way because there's an assumption dwight that the the male athlete has except for rare exceptions has more strength more speed uh, the things that we had talked about. This is it's proven. Over well, because and over structurally, again. structurally, I mean, just physiologically, uh, a male versus female. I mean, as as the body develops and grows. So if you have a female who 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 trans over into a male, I mean, even though you know uh, there's 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 testosterone and chemicals that are that are related to that. Uh, I don't think you have the type of advantage that the the transgender female would have over over uh, uh, the women athletes as opposed to the transgender well, male. So, over so let, me, let me just play devil's advocate here, right? So we want to make sure that we're just not targeting women because that's unconstitutional. So you don't feel sorry for the trans men who were born women to use your words, you don't feel sorry that like naturally uh, born men might hurt the trans men because you don't because this is about gender. Well, on really, that, uh, Jolanda, unfortunately, on that, <laughs> on that, is, uh, on that, yeah, on that, that could be a this, whole show, by the way, Jolanda. <laughs> but our time is up, so I want to I want to thank uh, Judge Dwight Jefferson and. Uh, at least, I, I believe one of the world's greatest athletes is, and, and a great lawyer, Jolanda Jones. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, I and a great and a great public servant. Also. Absolutely. Well, you were too, right? Still could be. Uh, I want to thank you for watching. We'll be back next week at the same time and same place. You can email the show at Gary Pollan at AmericanStarTV.com. And you can get my bi-weekly newsletter, The Texas Conservative Review, by signing up for free at TexasConservativeReview.com. Remember in the immortal words of Ronald Reagan, uh, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, where we sentence them to take the final step into a thousand years of a new dark age. I'll see you next week. We better get to work.